Bruce Springsteen's elegant eulogy to love and loss um, has particular meaning for me. I worked with a client for a number of uh, years who's actually recently returned, um, for whom the song you're missing was both a metaphor for what we would work with in psychotherapy as he uh, mourned the loss of his wife and became a single father to two young daughters, um, as well as a guide for all the things that we would have to come to terms with together. Um, the lyrics of coming home and noticing what all the reminders of uh, his wife. And we grieve those losses piece by piece, moment by moment, article by article. It's also um, a reminder of the strength that remains. Um, Bruce Springsteen is the bard of my home state of New Jersey, or my adopted home state, and he uh, sings of not just the pain of communities, but the strength of communities. So that's a, uh, those are emerging, intersecting themes that we will work with throughout this conference. I'm going to be going through these uh, topics quite quickly. I, I want to try to stay on target as much as I can time-wise, make up a little bit of time. My colleague Diane Kane, I always love hearing her talk, and I don't want to shortchange her, so some of this I'm going to be going through a bit quickly. The physical facts and the emotional facts are oftentimes where we start with people. Um, the physical realities of their loss, and these are some uh, summary facts of who we lost on 9-11, um, how many people were affected, uh, 3,051 children roughly have lost, had lost a parent, and the remarkable fact of uh, over 1,700 people had no remains. And we know how important psychologically and spiritually it is for people to have the remains of loved ones to grieve and mourn, to properly bury, and what it means psychologically, spiritually, to go forward without that. And the uh, high percentage of people all across the country that in some way were affected by this, that knew someone uh, directly or indirectly. And then there's the emotional facts, um, the impact of losses across time. Um, how we know that the experience of loss changes time. There's a certain timelessness, and not necessarily in positive ways, that emerges from how disorienting losses and multiple losses can be for us. And the, I have a quote from some of the people that I've worked with over the years that sort of illustrates some of these points. So in terms of, of the impact and sort of this neurophysiological dysregulation and destabilization we feel, uh, when we've lost so much and how it changes our experience of time. It's summed up by a quote of, of one of the people that I was honored to work with. She said to me, it could have been a minute or a day or a month. I just lost all sense of time. I remember someone asking me at the store once what time it was. I burst into tears and I shouted at her, how the hell should I know? And that sort of captures what happens to us with the sense of time. And then there's the impact of time across losses. Um, the, the tasks of yearning and searching, of remembering and forgetting, and how grief and grief work and trauma work is this uh, dance, sometimes painful, sometimes resilient, of mourning what was, looking for what is to be, um, of remembering and forgetting. I worked with uh, um, the gentleman I referenced uh, through the song has recently come back to psychotherapy. I, I worked with him for a while. And the unconscious keeps time. It's said that the unconscious keeps time, and I've, I've noticed that. I've had three people that I worked with uh, after 9-11 call and come back, and Diane's shaking her head. She's probably had the same experience, come, uh, wanting to come back for, to talk more. And uh, he said to me when he came back a few weeks ago, sometimes I worry I won't, re I won't remember things, like our anniversary. For so long, all I wanted to do was be able to forget. But now I wonder if, all, if, if I won't be able to remember, because all I have of her are our memories, and I feel like I'm losing them little by little. So that sort of feeling prompted him to want to return uh, as he tries to hold on to what was and still move forward uh, into what is unknown. And then lastly, the ripple effect of these forces of time and space uh, and gravity and sorrow. Uh, across communities, within families, and across communities, and how we know that uh, these losses have affected all of us. The community that's in this room, and then the communities that each one of you represents as well. 
I'm going to summarize some of the psychosocial effects. So we're going to step away from the emotion, get into the cognitive for a while, give you a bit of a break, uh, come, probably come back to a bit of emotion. But really, in some ways, it's a metaphor for what we ask people to do, to balance hearts and minds, to be able to balance making sense of things and experiencing and feeling things as we move forward. Over and over again, our work involves these three spheres of influence. Um, the force of trauma, uh, which has its own sort of gravitational pull. Uh, the brain and the mind and body. And I look at the brain as different than the mind. And when I say mind now, I automatically say mind-body. Uh, I've worked with different cultures enough to have that really steeped into me that uh, it's one word to me now, the mind and body together. Um, and culture being the center of that. For many of us, culture is how we experience the texture of the world. It's how we experience every moment. So these three spheres of influence we come back to over and over again in how we work with people. Quick summary from a recent article uh, just came out last year um, from um, George Bonanno at Columbia University, uh, Chris Bruin, who Dr. Halpern and IDMH had here as a keynote. Uh, lucky for all of us who were here a couple of years ago that summarized uh, much of the disaster research field. As we all know, disasters can cause serious psychological harm but to a minority of individuals. That's a minority of individuals. Um, it produces, disasters produce multiple outcomes. Uh, and again, there's obviously some differences. D human intention, disasters of human intention, terroristic acts, as we know, have a somewhat different path of, of outcomes with uh, more severe effects. But still, in terms of aggregate data, they, produ they produce multiple outcomes, um, including psychological resilience. And psychological resilience is the default outcome. In Bonanno's research uh, predating this in 2003, he looked at 2,752 people and saw that in 65% of people, resilience was the eventual outcome to traumatic events. Even in those who are severely exposed, it rarely falls below 30%. So we know that there are forces of gravity, again, within us that pull us toward health, pull us toward recovery. The outcomes depend upon a combination of risk and resilience factors within the individual, in communities, what we can do, what we have to work with. Uh, and they put families and communities at risk for negative health out outcomes. And we know that the research on uh, the long-term effects of trauma yield significant results on negative health outcomes, not just mental health outcomes, but uh, physical health outcomes as well. Just quickly summarizing some of the early uh, research, picking a couple of uh, the primary articles that have been cited a lot over the last 10 years, uh, post 9-11. In the four to eight weeks after the uh, Trade Center attacks, in a survey of about 990 adults, 7.5% met the criteria for PTSD, almost 10% for major depressive disorder. And then within um, about four months, we saw those fall and drop almost by half. And that's the kind of uh, trajectory that we want to see. So that's what we're looking for. We're seeing distress high immediately after the event because that's what happens. But then we want to see distress start to fall. And we're typically looking at a three-month window, and this was a four-month follow-up. And then uh, Galea and his colleagues also, also looked at some of the risk factors that are noted there as well, which many of us uh, know and, and continue to try to develop programs to address those particular factors, such as hyperarousal, residents uh, below Canal Street, meaning greater exposure, et cetera. Continuing effects from some more current research, um, as we study the longer uh, effects longer out, uh, about 12.5% of PTSD rates continue in a, in a sample of a large sample of 11,000 adults, just to make a quick note um, for many of you, I believe that all of these will be all of these presentations will be on the website, so you'll have access to all of these on the website, just so you don't have to worry about jotting down figures. They'll be made available to you as well as references. Um, so we see an upsurge then um, in PTSD, and that may be delayed onset, that may be renewed um, experiences of trauma that have been triggered. So we see somewhat of an upsurge. And in a primary care sample, again, we see this drop uh, in PTSD rates almost by half. But interestingly here, major depression is a predictive factor for later PTSD. So over and over again, we're getting the message not to focus just on PTSD. PTSD is actually the fourth most common outcome to traumatic events. Depression and other outcomes in terms of uh, psychological problems are more common, but we focused uh, a lot on PTSD for the better and for the worse. So I'll be referencing that a bit as we continue. 
There's also been positive results. Um, that after 9-11, there was an increase in pro-social behavior. People wanted to do good. We remember that. We wanted to pull together. We wanted to do good. There was greater engagement in political activities, religious activities, um, and uh, that, that started to emerge fairly soon after 9-11. So pathways to recovery. What are these different outcomes and pathways that we uh, are wanting to examine. And there's three, again, here there's three sources of influence that we've looked at summarizing the research. There's the characteristics of the person, and we're well aware of all these risk factors that have been identified over the last 10 years, not just with the studies on 9-11, but with worldwide studies uh, looking at all the different events, Katrina, the experiences in Haiti, etc. We know that um, being female puts us more at risk, and that also children are at greater risk prior exposure to trauma being one of the most important risk factors. And then from a neurophysiological perspective, the prolonged hyperarousal, that that seems to be a marker for potential uh, negative outcomes in terms of PTSD, early prolonged hyperarousal. The event characteristics, we understand that those events of human intention, again, have greater um, negative effects on people. And exposure, greater exposure, there's a dose-response relationship particularly to grotesque images. And then there's something about being trapped and being unable to flee. So that experience stays in people's bodies. Again, it's a neurophysiological regulation aspect. It stays in people's bodies. And lastly, what the post-trauma uh, environment, post-disaster environment looks like. And this is where we have can sort of put in our greatest investment, is being able to create what's called salutogenic, health-promoting uh, uh, environments for people. And Emily Ozer and her colleagues uh, actually disputed some of the meta-analysis of PTSD research. And instead of focusing so much on hyperarousal and these individual person characteristics, she said it was really the aspects of the environment, the peritraumatic aspects of the environment, what people um, had available to them that in some ways was the best predictor. So we know from uh, our experiences that people come in with many secondary assaults. It's not just the initial trauma, but what they've had to experience in terms of people's misunderstanding and lack of empathy that has been traumatic for them as well. And a lot of what we want to do is increase social support and protect people from further loss and stress. This is kind of a flip side of uh, some of uh, Bonanno's graphs on um, the trajectory of of outcomes, looking at adjustment. And adjustment here signifies both distress and dysfunction. So we sort of put those together in a blender and we come up with these general um, assessments of, of, adapt, of adjustment. And we're looking at four different profiles. The first being stress resistance. Oops, sorry about that. The first being stress resistance, which is different than resilience. Uh, I don't have a great deal of time to talk about that, but the current research is really talking about those as different aspects. Um, so these folks, remarkably, don't show much of a dip in adjustment. Um, manageable distress, manageable dysfunction. Resilience is that sharp drop, um, but then a very quick upswing, so being able to recover quickly. The additional adaptation strategies or protracted recovery, some people take longer to recover. It takes them much longer. They're in that uh, bottom well of suffering for a longer period of time. And so what can we do to assist their recovery? And then lastly, the small percentage of people who will show severe persisting distress, which leads to psychological disorders. Most of these reactions, as we know, dissipate over time. And the window, again, a lot of the questions in, in the research now are so what period of time. Those are difficult to answer, but we're looking again for that drop in distress, the increase in functioning over about a three-month period of time. Again, severe problems are typically seen in less than 30% of the population. So resilience is the norm. However, and this is a big however, those that fail to show improvement after about six months are at great risk for chronic problems, not just PTSD, depression, substance abuse, health effects, physical health effects, and that those things can become chronic over time and take a large percentage of our health care dollars and resources. So how can we identify those folks early is one question. For example, Kessler found way back in 1995, which seems like a long time ago now, that a third of people with PTSD fail to recover after many years. So that first year is really critical. And what can we offer people that will enhance chances of recovery? What does this mean for us in terms of interventions? So science is only helpful for us in this room who are pragmatists and clinicians and first responders if we can do something with it. So what can we do with this? 
And I sort of tailored my remarks here to the things that we can prevent and the things that we can promote. I will tell you now that I think we've spent a lot of time trying to prevent the bad stuff. And I think that those efforts are warranted and I uh, herald those uh, efforts and I think we should continue them. However, I think we should balance them a bit more with trying to promote the good stuff. I think we should recognize we have so much research now that talks about the resilience of people, that talks about those positive trajectories, pro-social behaviors. So what are things that we can do to promote that? So those are both aspects I think need to be balanced. And if I can just say in my humble opinion, we've done a little bit of short shrift to the promoting health aspects, focusing more on preventing disorders, and it takes both. But what are we trying to prevent? So these are some of the negative trajectories, um, psychosocial consequences of exposure to potentially traumatic events, all those that we're familiar with. But we tend to neglect some of the subclinical syndromes, uh, such as interpersonal distress, the disharmony, um, the disengagement, the conflict that trauma can cause in people and in couples. Um, I ended up starting to see one individual who was a first responder for a period of time and uh, over a period of time ended up working with both he and his wife as a couple because the trauma became embedded in their relationship. So in this country we tend to look at trauma because we're an individualistic society, we tend to look at trauma as something that resides within the individual. But collectivist societies and those in other worlds and cultures know that trauma exists in the system whether it's the marriage, the family, the community, the society. So it exists within a system. And much of our interventions that are related to the individual will have minimal impact on those uh, more systemic aspects of trauma, so how we can leverage that as well. And related to that is spiritual distress. Uh, we don't have a DSM diagnosis for that, but I am delighted to see the speakers and looking forward to the speakers will be talking about that. I wish I was not giving a workshop because there's about five workshops I'd like to attend, including um, the ones on spiritual care, which I think are so important. And again, many cultures uh, that are seen as more primitive than ours, I see as actually more advanced because for centuries they have given voice to the spiritual, act, spiritual aspects of health and healing and recovery. But to understand that all of these, if we look at PTSD as a, as a modal sort of response, PTSD is being understood as a disorder of non-recovery. So there's, a, again, a natural drive and push toward health, and what can we do to get the barriers of that natural drive out of the way? Um, so we look at PTSD as a disorder of non-recovery, but many of these may also be disorders of non-recovery. Something gets in the way of the natural healing processes of us humans. And what, consequently, what we try to promote is more than just the absence of disorder, that health is more than the absence of illness. It is uh, the sense of overall well-being. So resilience, self-efficacy, the sense of uh, strength uh, and confidence in one's strength, coping adaptively, engagement with communities, um, and meaning. We are meaning-making creatures. Our brains are wired to make sense of what has happened to us, uh, of the world. We look for patterns of things. So how can we leverage those natural healing processes in the brain? And an old concept um, reinvigorated by Antonovsky, who's done a lot of research in this, on salutogenesis, which is a fancy word for looking at other trajectories than disease and pathology. Again, the Western world is sort of geared toward a disease and pathology model. Um, and salutogenesis is geared toward, geared toward a health well-being model, uh, a growth model. So what are the things that promote those factors of health and well-being in individuals, in families, in communities, and in cultures? A basic concept that all of us learned in graduate school and has such relevance. I come back to this over and over and over again in my work. I had this, however, 30 years ago in graduate school, but over and over again come back to the importance of people's hierarchy of needs. And that in disaster situations, we're primarily working on those bottom three sources of needs, the biological and physical needs, you're not going to really be able to talk with anybody in an effective way if they're sleep deprived, if they're hungry, um, if they're ill. So attending to those needs is a large part of what we do. Safety needs. And safety has a physical aspect to it and a psychological component. People need to feel psychologically safe. So this is a need that runs through the entire pyramid, I think. Because until people have an inherent sense of safety in their environment and in a safety in their healing relationship with you and others, they're not going to be able to achieve other needs. And lastly, the need for belongingness and love. And again, if I can say, I think this is something we haven't leveraged as much as we could. 
in our responses to disasters and the post-disaster environment. People have a need for connection. They have a need to help one another. There's a lot written about attachment research. We talk about attachment behaviors. Part of that is exploring the environment, and part of that is giving to others. So attachment involves exploring, and attachment involves giving. And how can we emphasize and build on those natural needs? Hobfall and his colleagues summarized uh, aspects of interventions that are effective in the immediate uh, aftermath of disasters. Um, that included mass casualties as well as the midterm points. And he came up with these five elements. Safety, again, over and over again, we come back to that sense of safety that people have, need to have. Calming, what aspects of the environment, what aspects of how we work with people provide a sense of calming. We all know what it's like to feel very, very distressed, very, very agitated, and then some good, kind soul comes over to us, I'm looking at Carla, uh, some good kind soul comes over to us and just by watching her, just by her kindness, just by her calm presence and her compassion, I start to self-regulate. So ways that we can do that very simply, we don't need fancy technology, we don't need fancy psychotherapies, just that very simple human to human contact that can help regulate. Self-efficacy, building on people's sense of resilience, that they have survived difficult things in the past, we will survive difficult things again. Connectedness and hope. I'm a big one in leveraging hope and speaking openly about hope. And when you're working with people who are very hopeless, you have to hold the hope for them. So you sometimes have to state that explicitly, that you're going to hold the hope for them until they can take it from you again. But to not be afraid to talk about things like hope and faith. Models of intervention, just very quickly, this is what we're moving to. Um, in emerging research is understanding the, a phase-oriented response, understanding that different people need different things at different points in time. So this is sort of an emerging best practice, practice, promising practice timeline in terms of what we do. We now know that psychological first aid is an emerging best practice. It's the best thing to offer people. Uh, there's more research that needs to be done, but we know for sure that it doesn't harm people. So that's a very important point. First thing, do no harm and that psychological first aid provides that very much needed support and connectedness that can help people regulate, reduce arousal. And we know that that may have positive salutogenic effects. Crisis intervention and uh, new modules that SAMHSA are de uh, de developing called Skills for Psychological Recovery, SPR, which is sort of the next step beyond PFA. So people who um, are at greater risk for what we call subclinical distress, have had some risk factors, have a more impoverished environment, we want to be able to provide them more support. So um, I think of S skills for psychological recovery as something between PFA, crisis intervention, and ongoing psychotherapy. And then we know that there will be some people who don't respond to any of these interventions or who show such risk and have such a history in the beginning that we want to target them and triage them right to targeted treatments. And to be able to provide treatments that we know are helpful for people with depression, um, PTSD, alcohol abuse. So targeted treatments, an example being cognitive processing therapy with Dr. Halpern and, uh, and, and the IDMH uh, Institute brought uh, Patty Rezik, who is the creator of uh, CPT, last year. Um, many of us attended that. So that's one of the evidence-supported treatments that we know is helpful. And one lesson learned is that I don't think we've talked enough about traumatic grief and provided people enough for uh, interventions and assistance with grief. And again, in other cultures, it's the grief that's really uh, assisted with. That's the, that's the target for assistance, is, is the grief in the community, more than the tra trauma of the, of the event, but the, the grief that ensues. We've made targets of intervention, um, the things that we want to reduce. So we've made the negative aspects, the problems, and that's where we've made targets of intervention. Reduce depression, reduce hyperarousal, decrease alcohol use, those kind of things. From again, from a health and well-being, a salutogenic approach, we want to increase those aspects that we know are related to positive outcomes. So we want to work on the positive side of the equation, not just the negative side. And so what do we want to promote? What do we want to target? Social support, which the research shows is one of the key factors and best predictors of positive outcomes. So people who are exposed to, to traumatic events, one of the key predictors is the degree and depth of social support that they have. Self-efficacy and resiliency, which I mentioned over and over again. So I'm going to just touch on a couple of these. Lots said about social support. What is it? 
what can we do with that? So a couple of factors. Uh, we're looking at depth and breadth of social support networks, specific things that we can do that promote connection. And lastly, Bonanno and Bruin's article talks about uh, the emerging science shows that there's a difference between received support and perceived support. How much people actually receive immediately after a disaster seems to be key. So we know we've got to give people a lot. But what matters over time, it seems like, is perceived support. And there's a moderate correlation between these. So you would think that people might accurately perceive that the more they get, the more they feel like they get. But that's not the case. So we need to understand these factors better and see what we need to do to increase people's perceived support, the perception that we're helping them, and what might get in the way of that. A big part of what we did in uh, Project Phoenix, which is uh, the New Jersey sister program to uh, Project Liberty, was develop peer support programs leveraging uh, social support in more formalized ways. Um, I know the United Nations and, and, and many organizations have really worked hard to incorporate peer support, and there's a lot of good research emerging there. The mechanisms of action why peer support is helpful seems to be based on two things. One is what's called the stress buffering model, that people immediately after a traumatic event benefit from uh, the reduction in stress that increased support brings. And then the other is the main effect model, and that this is peer support helps even outside of stressful periods. So it can be an inoculation and a prevention and a resiliency building program. It helps outside the stressful events. And one of the ways it does that is to promote positive psychological states. And another main effect is that it seems to reduce people's avoidance. So the natural avoidance people have to not want to face pain and suffering, peer support seems to help reduce that avoidance so people can deal with things in positive and adaptive ways. Just watching my time here. <coughs> um, so I'm zipping through this. Promoting resilience. Again, stress resistance is different from resilience. How do people get to be one versus the other? Is one better than the other? What can we do to understand these factors better as time goes on? And then differentiating resilience from post-traumatic growth. There's an inverse relationship between these two. Post-traumatic growth is experiencing the depths of despair. You're in the bowels of trauma, and you rise out of that and move not just to your pre disaster, pre-trauma level of functioning, but you move beyond that to experience a higher level of functioning, a higher level of spiritual awareness, if you will, that there's something that you gain from this. Um, and there's a wonderful book um, called The Strength That Remains, uh, written by a young man who survived the genocide in Burundi. Uh, there's a, it's well known that the Rwandan genocide is um, well documented and and uh, just to note that this is uh, the anniversary week of the Rwandan genocide, um, 18 years, I believe, um, 17 years, excuse me. But in Burundi, they face a similar uh, tragedy. And so the strength that remains is really about uh, one man's journey toward post-traumatic growth, how one can rise above and beyond things. And that... Um, is the difference between uh, healing and transformation. So in my work uh, as a practitioner, I really distinguish between recovery, which is getting back people back to where they were before and their lives are, are functional and reasonable. Healing, which means not just the original wound, not just the original trauma, for example, from 9-11 is uh, healed but some older wounds are healed as well. Because for many of the people that we work with, they come to their suffering with uh, histories of suffering and the gravity of those losses. And then finally, transformation as a third trajectory, where something kind of remarkable happens in people and happens in the space between and among people. And the effects are widespread beyond the individual. So transformation being possible as well. Um, understanding the multidimensional aspects of resilience and identifying those who are at risk, what makes them vulnerable, and what can we do that can be protective. We're moving more from understanding resilience um, as an individual attribute to understanding it as something that's more dynamic and fluid in the environment that we can uh, change and influence. Longer term issues are shifting from intervention to treatment, and how to do that as smoothly um, and compassionately as possible. It was very difficult for us in Project Phoenix. Uh, our 9-11 uh, 
uh, SAMHSA program, FEMA program, to transition people from what we were offering to traditional treatment when they needed that? What can we do to make that uh, transition less painful for both the, the responders and the, the people that we serve? The changing nature of grief, uh, we all have experienced how loss and our experience of grief changes over time. And we shift from the pain of remembering sometimes to the fear of forgetting um, and how we continue to honor those that we've loved and lost. And lastly, uh, how to identify and effectively work with the chronicity of trauma spectrum disorders. PTSD not being the only one, depression, substance abuse, spiritual distress, uh, hopelessness. Uh, what can we do to, to contain the chronicity. Yes, they may go out beyond that year point, but what can we do to make it uh, not affect someone's life for the remainder of their life? From a community perspective, uh, Lloyd Potter's psychiatrist, um, and then the year after Hurricane Katrina, SAMHSA sponsored a conference there. There was a wonderful conference, and he talked about working with communities to foster humanity um, and sustaining community engagement. So taking what we do with people in individual ways and building that into community programs. He talked about leveraging social capital, leveraging social capital. He characterized communities on different dimensions, one being competence, how competent and effective they were in getting resources for themselves, advocating for themselves uh, politically, economically, and how responsible they were. Was there a high degree of responsibility for one another? So we want to build communities that are highly competent, have the skills and knowledge and abilities to get what they need for themselves, but also feel a great sense of responsibility for one another. We all know communities that are competent, you know, upper middle class enclaves that know how to get resources, but don't feel the sense of responsibility towards one another. And so how can we really develop that and, and build on that? A sense of shared responsibility. Lastly, I, I'm never good at conclusions um, because I, I don't feel like I know anywhere near enough to give you any conclusions. So let me just say that and put that on the table. But I have a lot of questions uh, about where we may go from here. So to touch on some of those, how can we use this emerging science, which is very exciting for those of us who have a couple of toes or a, a whole body in academia, um, and how can we use what we know to promote natural recovery, natural, natural healing? What can we do? Uh, for myself, who has a particular interest in cultural practices, what are some cultural practices we can learn from across the world that we can adopt and adapt here to be able to use to promote health and well-being? Uh, and are there universal interventions or universal elements of interventions that cut across cultures um, that we can learn from? How do we assess the timing of interventions? Timing is everything. So how do we know what to do when? Um, because that seems to be a key thing. Doing too much too soon can be just as dangerous as doing too little too late. So we need to really understand what are the timing of uh, the interventions we offer. And lastly, because I'm sort of community oriented in how I work, how we can build joint communities of practice-based evidence. In the academic world, there's a lot of talk of evidence-based practice. I think us practitioners and first responders got to get in the game. And how can we develop practice-based evidence? How can we feed back to the scholars and academicians what we know and what we see and what we've learned in ways that can inform the science and build on the uh, professions. So a few last uh, lessons learned. Um, again, sadly, from the Fukushima plant. Uh, Japan, who is well known for being um, a stellar representative of disaster preparedness and exemplar, learned the limits of that, that we cannot prepare for everything. Related to that, not every question has an answer. So one last quote from uh, uh, one of my clients. I guess what helped the most is getting with the idea that there's just no answers. I'm not going to get the answers. Why did this happen? Why him? Why now? So I don't feel like I have to keep knocking on God's door with all these questions anymore. There are many paths to recovery. There's a whole world of recovery options in each one of us. And then multiply that times communities. There's a whole, there are many, many paths to recovery. There's not one right way. Faith and family at the end of the day are what counts. Sorry to say mental health professionals, but people are not going to come flocking to us when they lose someone. Maybe later, maybe not, but faith and family at the end of the day are what people need. So again, how can we use what we know to build communities where, um, that may be lacking in some of those social supports or where families have been really decimated? 
There are many, many ways of defining faith and family. Whole new social structures came up after 9-11. People lost, uh, there was a, a family I worked with where the woman had lost her husband and her brother, and her brother's kids came to live with her, and so they formed an entire new family unit. There's online communities now. There's new social structures emerging all the time. There's structures of disaster responders working with survivors and community. There are new structures. Resilience may be learned as well as earned. And just a quick thing about why the penguins. Um, I worked with a program called the Traumatic Loss Coalition that was active before 9-11, and it works with communities to really intervene early with uh, traumatic loss for youth. And so our motto was the penguins. And penguins are remarkably resilient little beings. Um, they take care, and the reason they're resilient is they take care of each other. So when it's freezing, freezing cold, what they have is a system of keeping each other warm. So the coldest penguins go in the middle, and then all the penguins huddle around them, and so they take turns. And when the coldest penguins in the middle are cold, they rotate out, and then the penguins on the outside come in. So they find a way to take care of each other and keep each other alive and keep each other resilient. So we can learn some of these things, not just from penguins, but good example, um, that may know more than humans. And we can also, it's not just earned. Um, the, there are things that we can do to um, develop resilience. And lastly, I'm sorry, but we might need to improve our ability to learn from lessons learned. Uh, we have short memories. And uh, in some ways, that's a blessing. Um, but the next two days are about remembering. Um, so how can we use the memories that maybe the montage brought up for us, the, the talks you go to, that your connections with others that you make here, how can we learn, use that to learn um, more? And not just to learn more, but to put what we have learned to use. So I started off with kind of the bard of New Jersey, Bruce Springsteen, and I'm going to end with another uh, bard, an uh, uh, Irish poet by the name of John Donahue. Um, his, the name of his poem is For Lost Friends, and it appeared on a website, a uh, poetry website that I, a listserv that I belong to a few days after uh, the disaster in Japan, um, and they dedicated it for the people of Japan. So I dedicate it to all of us and for the work that we have done and those that we have lost. As twilight makes a rainbow robe from the concealed colors of day, in order for time to stay alive within the dark weight of night, may we lose no one we love from the shelter of our hearts. May we have the grace to see, despite the hurt of rupture, the searing of anger, and the empty disappointment, that whoever we have loved, such love can never quench. Though a door may have closed, closed between us, may we be able to view our lost friends with eyes wise with calming grace. Forgive them the damage that we were left to inherit. And may we wish them the peace where spirit can summon beauty from wounded space. Thank you. <laughs>